After all sorts of drama and turbulence, Linkin Park have finally released their new record from zero with their new lead singer, Emily Armstrong, and I'm here to dive into all of it. But before I do, hey, hi, hello, welcome to the channel, my name is Dan Frampton. Do I need to explain who Linkin Park is? Uh, anyway, I will a little bit. They were like a 2000s new metal band. You might know the song One Step Closer. They ended up capturing the hearts and minds of millions of people across the nation playing their brand of new metal music, rap and rock. How novel. Their sound would change and evolve over time into something much worse than it was at the very beginning, but in 2017, tragedy struck when we lost their lead singer, Chester Bennington. They went on a little bit of a hiatus, and earlier this year, they announced that they were coming back with a new singer, a new tour, a new album, the full shebang. It is time to go full throttle Linkin Park, and the hype was real. They did a live stream whole event where they played like a whole concert with their new singer as they simultaneously announced everything that I just ran through. And for one entire day, the entire world was hyped for this. If nothing more than just a curiosity thing, people's interests were definitely peaked. But the day would pass and things would come out, controversies regarding the new lead singer, Emily Armstrong. People thought that she sounded pretty good in the song Emptiness Machine that they released alongside all of this with a music video, but they weren't really stoked with her relationship with Danny Masterson back in the day. I made a couple videos going over this entire topic, so if you want like a more nuanced deep dive on it, I suggest going and watching those videos. But alongside the Danny Masterson association drama, there was Scientology drama tied to it as well. Now Scientology is kind of known as being like a ruthless, vicious cult that kind of separates you from your family if you kind of speak out about them. And they have a lot of really strange practices. I'm not here to do a full deep dive on Scientology either, but it came out, at least as a rumor, that went on to be confirmed that Emily Armstrong kind of came up in Scientology. Now when she addressed this sort of thing, she did kind of like an Instagram story post that didn't even scratch the surface, that might have been five words long. She kind of just brushed off the Danny Masterson thing, was like, hey, yeah, I knew him, but once I found out, I stopped knowing him. I was like, okay, girl, yeah, thank you for the statement. But she didn't address any of the Scientology stuff because... Scientology is very scary. If you want to learn about how scary Scientology is, there's a ton of resources out there for you. So all of this swirling out there on the internet, the band refused to address it. Head down, trudging forward, we're just gonna go ahead with our plan as planned. But Chester Bennington's son stuck his head out of the sand a little bit and started ruffling some feathers, but his little drama came and went like a fart in the wind, unfortunately. I did a whole video about the Chester son situation. It's back there if you want more information on that. The band just kept pushing forward. We're doing from zero. We're doing from zero. And by God, they did from zero. This Friday, that record came out to the most mixed reviews I have ever seen in my entire life. Nobody's out there giving this perfect ratings, not even the big meat rider journalists out there that normally hand out hundreds. The way that rich houses hand out full candy bars during Halloween. So speaking of reviews, I thought we would go on to this website over here, it's called Album of the Year, and it basically amalgamates all the reviews out there. And you see it has a critic score of 75, which is pretty solid. But all of these guys normally hand out hundreds so willy-nilly, but nobody's willing to do it. All kind of solid though, 80s, 85s. Then some critics are like, nah, this isn't really it, boys and girls. But critic scores can't be trusted in the year 2024. It is a pay-to-play, access journalism type game out there. Nobody's actually being mean, no one's actually being critical, because everybody wants to be in the cool crowd. Everybody wants the cool bands to like them, so they're not going to really say anything too bad. But the people, the people will definitely 
pipe up and the people are saying this is no more than a 62. Of course all the fanboys are going crazy and all the people that are trying to prove points to the soy boys are going this is the best record of all time bro. But if you dig into any of the reviews, if you listen to anybody talking about it, even meat rider extraordinaire Nick Nocturnal, they're all just saying Nah, it's pretty mid. It's okay. There's a couple bangers. There's a couple flops. It's just corporate radio stadium rock and roll with the Linkin Park brand name just slapped on top of it. But here is my review. I know you might be curious about my thoughts on the record. I gave it a 39 out of 100 and I said, I love Emily's voice. The songs, however, are, how do I put it? Hmm, bad. The rapping is so funny in a corny and whack sort of way. There's a fucking reggae song, LMAO. Lighters up, Snoop Dogg would love the song Overflow. I can't stress enough how funny the rapping is. I am in stitches over here as I write this. It's a shame how great of a voice the new singer possesses because A, she doesn't seem chill, and B, these songs suck butts. I feel bad for the people that are lying to themselves pretending that the record is good. You will hear every opinion under the sun about this project. Most people will come away from this thinking that it's mid. Let me assure you though, this is worse than mid. It's bad. But it's the best kind of bad. It's so bad, it's good. It's so funny. I think this record is absolutely hilarious. No good songs, all skips. I-G-Y-E-I-H kinda slaps, not gonna lie. So yeah, those were my thoughts. I thought it was very funny. The rapping is so corny, and it just has this corporate sheen on it that just makes me chuckle so hard. Like, it's so ham-fisted. How do people not see it? It's so funny. Anyway, enjoy your Linkin Park, people. And the popular reviews over here aren't very nice to it either. We got a 40, we got a 50, we got a 57. Came for the Linkin Park, but got stinking fart instead. Yeah, it's pretty stinking, pretty farty. <laughs> not the best record ever. But if you just go over to Google, Google's like, nah, five stars. Everybody is five stars <laughs> on Google. We love this record on Google. Really, five stars, people. Everybody out here claiming that this is like one of the best records of all time. It is so funny. Like I said, you're gonna get the five stars. You're gonna get the zero stars and everything in between. People are pretty upset. People are pretty scathing, but I found one review that is absolutely loving this record and it comes to us from Lord Xenu himself, the god of the Scientology religion. And I'm thinking, yeah, this is exactly who this project is for. Because when I'm listening to it, that's the question I'm asking myself. Who is this for? Who could possibly like this thing? And I found the one person who genuinely really does, and it's Lord King Xenu himself. So I thought we would read his most poignant and most relevant review. I'll throw up some gameplay or something. Let's dive in. Hey there, people of Earth. The name's Xenu. You may remember me from such cults as Scientology and other such books like Dianetics, The Secret Copy. I'm like God or whatever. Today, I'm here to talk to you about my star pupil, Emily Armstrong, and her band, Linkin Park. They dropped an album called from zero, and I don't have to tell you that that title is a nod to ya boy. That's right, the title is actually meant to be from Xenu. That's me, baby, and let me tell you, it was a delightful love letter that would have made L. Ron Hubbard cream his peen. The album is so full of coded secrets to the overlord. Again, that's me, but my problem is, I'm sick of everything being shrouded in a thick fog of secrecy. I'm here to blow the lid off this whole thing. Today, I'm gonna tell you what they really meant by From Xenu. Scientology is based, and I am the one and only true based God. We here at the Galactic Federation are really enjoying the work of Emily and believe she can be our version of what Christians call their savior, Jesus Christ Almighty. She just dropped her first testament. From Xenu opens with the title track as an intro. It sounds good, but it's just a little bit too cryptic. It should have been the same sort of voice memo quality audio type thing, but all it really needed to say was all hail Xenu. The next track, The Emptiness Machine, was their first teaser single, and it was the first time the audience was introduced to our messiah, 
Emily Armstrong. It's also meant to be a welcome guide to the Sea Org for new recruits. Lines like going around like a revolver and fire under the altar are direct references to the welcoming rituals we have here at the Org. She cleverly got us a few new sailors off the back of this track. Cut the bridge really should be called rid your body of thetans. Those nasty thetans need to be discovered through an audit. This song might actually have the power to replace our current stress test in this auditing process. But I'm gonna suggest we use both. I mean, I'm gonna demand it. I am Lord King Xenu after all. It shall be. Heavy as the Crown is a song about how hard it is to be said Lord King Xenu. The Crown is indeed very heavy. It's lonely here at the top. Her deep understanding of this endears me. The fact that this song had a hundred million spins before the album even came out doesn't hurt either. I am amazing and Emily did a great job conveying that in this song. Over Each Other is a clever allusion to how we make our members tell us all their deepest, darkest secrets just to catalog them and hold them over your head in order to manipulate you into staying with the church and keeping you believing our out of this world beliefs. The song Casualty kinda speaks for itself if I'm being honest. The song is about Shelly and it's beautiful. Well done Emily, David loves it. Overflow is by far my favorite song on the album. Nothing is cryptic or coded here. This is just a danceable little number that I am in the process of ordering my people to turn into our official anthem. You wouldn't believe the amount of paperwork and administration that goes into such a thing. Two-Faced is a tale of our fallen enemies, also known as the people who abandon us and those who speak out. Our main enemy is Louis Thoreau. We hate that guy. I-G-Y-E-I-H stands for I got your eyeballs in here. That's just a cute little thing Elrond would say when he would gouge out your eyes and put them in a jar. This was his most adorable manipulation tactic. The closing track, Good Things Go, is about the time I stole the dumbest aliens from the 76 planets I rule over and took them to a base of this crazy volcano. I pumped a bunch of H-bombs into that lava geyser and pressed the red detonate button. It's basically what we built the whole religion on. No big deal. So there it is. I felt I just had to clear that up real quick. From Xenu is the best album of all time. Join Scientology, all hail me, Xenu. And who's to argue with that if the music appeases the overlord and he's gonna turn one of the songs into the national anthem or whatever, I think that that means the record is a hit. So I hated the record, Xenu loved the record. What did you think of the record? Comment down below. All comments left within the first three hours, I will reply to. Three hour gang for life. But for now, I'm gonna get out of here. Thank you so much for watching. Until my next upload, watch another upload. Okay, take care and have a good one.